Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. A very warm well, welcome to this service of thanksgiving for the coronation. We're absolutely delighted to be joined today by the, one of the deputy lieutenants for County Tyrone, Liz Cuddy. You're most welcome. Thank you so much for making time on what is a very, very busy weekend for you to be here with us. It's also lovely to be joined this morning by the Reverend Dr. Ian Jemison, who will be instituted as rector of Moy in just over a week's time. But you're very welcome to Castle Coffin for your first trip. And hopefully the next time you're back, will be in the pulpit. Our coronation celebrations continue later on today. At 6 o'clock there is a youth parade to the Presbyterian Church with all the uniform organisations. And tomorrow there's a family fun day at the pavilion from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Today, as we give thanks, we hear again the words of scripture which were read yesterday in Westminster Abbey. We will sing again the ancient words of the Tudem and the hymns which were sung, beginning now with Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. King Charles III, and to rejoice together at this time of his coronation. We come to celebrate our traditions of faith, of liberty, of law, of government, of public service, of compassion. We come to pray for the well-being of all people, for the peace of the world, for the unity and prosperity of our nation, for the life of the Commonwealth, and for ourselves, that we may do justly and love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. And behold before God in prayer, our sovereign, King Charles, Camilla, his queen, all members of the royal family, and we ask that throughout their lives they may be sustained and renewed by the power of God's Holy Spirit. O God, 
who provides for your people by your power, and rule over us in love. Bless your servant Taurus, our King, that under him this realm may be widely governed, and your church may serve you in godliness and peace, and grant that he, being devoted to you with his whole heart, and persevere in your good works unto the end, may, by your guidance, come to your everlasting kingdom, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. We come to God as one, from whom no secrets are hidden, to ask for his forgiveness and for peace. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbors in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. By what we have done and by what we have failed to do, we are truly sorry to repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in the of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Charles, our King, and all God's people. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, bless our sovereign, Charles, our King, and all who are in authority under him, that they may order all things in wisdom and equity, righteousness and peace, to the honour and glory of your name, and the good of your church and people, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
first reading is from the Epistle of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 27. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to praise for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord and be all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and all suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us to meet, to be partakers of inheritance in the saints and light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, and the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day, is this scripture fulfilled in our ears? This is the word of the Lord.
this service of thanksgiving for the coronation of the king, we are reminded that you call us all to serve and have taught us that the power of the heart is greater than that of the power of wealth and might. Hear us as we kneel and pray together. O oh God, may our hearts be big enough to receive the greatness of your love. May our hearts be large enough to take all those who with us believe in Jesus Christ. May our hearts stretch far enough to take in all those who do not know you, but are our responsibility, because we do know you. And may there always be space in our hearts for the love of all your children as we answer your call to serve. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, the fountain of all goodness, hear our prayer and multiply your blessings upon your servant Camilla as she offers herself with humble devotion to your service. Defend her from all danger. Make her an example of virtue and godliness and a blessing to the King and to his people. Lord, in your mercy. God of compassion and grace. Your Son was sent not to be served, but to serve. We pray that you will give grace to his majesty, that he will find perfect freedom in your service. Bless and sanctify your servant Charles, upon whose head a crown was placed as a sign of royal majesty. Fill him day by day with your abundant grace and with all charitable virtues. May he always be a source of strength to his people and be an example to promote your honour and glory. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Lord God, for this, our nation, for Charles, our King, the Prime Minister, the members of his Cabinet, the representatives of the people here in Northern Ireland, the judges and magistrates, and all those in authority. We pray that you will rule their hearts, that they may wisely and justly fulfil the trust placed in them for our good and for your greater joy. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Lord God, for the commonwealth that binds together many races, language and cultures under our gracious King. Deepen our understanding of one another's needs. Strengthen among us the spirit of mutual responsibility and service as members of one family. And unite us all in the cause of justice, in the love of freedom, and in the quest for peace and order. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Loving God, we bring to you in prayer those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit as a result of the abuse of power. This morning we continue to pray for the people of Ukraine and Sudan. We pray for refugees, those who have lost a wife, a husband, children, parents, livelihoods, security or their home. Have mercy upon them and prosper those who seek to bring peace and help those in need. Lord, in your mercy. God of the living and Father of our risen Lord, we are glad in your presence today as we remember those who have gone before us. On this day as we give thanks for the coronation of their majesties. We are reminded of the example of our dearly beloved Queen Elizabeth II and those in this palace who are now members of your United Kingdom in heaven. Help us to follow all those who believed in your promises and trusted in your mercy. And with all your people on earth and in heaven, give you glory and praise. And in an act of fellowship, we join together in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, everyone.
May all the words we sing and hear and read and speak draw us ever closer to the living word, your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's nobody in the world who can do pageantry just like the British. It starts with the military, the infantry in their scarlet tunics and their bare skins, the cavalry with the horses exactly in step, the bands, the bugles, the pipes, the drums, the kettle drums mounted on horseback, and the mounted bands. Well, I was watching yesterday and thinking, what sort of talent does it take to play a trombone while you're riding a horse? and trying to keep in step with the horses in front of you. It's bad enough if you're seated. Add to that the royal family, and you have events like the Trooping of the Colour, which attract an audience of millions of people the world over. They colour the spectacle of pageantry. Millions of people tune in on television or turn up in the streets of London to see it every summer. But then, add in another level, the church. The great ancient medieval buildings that soar heavenwards. The clergy and their glistening robes, the choir, the musicians, the organ, the music and the mystery. And when it all comes together, we find ourselves standing at the intersection of pomp and circumstance and the gate of heaven. And I don't think there is any feeling that's possible other than awe and wonder. A coronation is for royal majesty and the holiness of God combined. And for most of us, it is the first time in our lives that we will have any living memory whatsoever of the event. A spectacle of colour, of music, of movement, of words. And in the midst of all of that grandeur and glory, it's very easy to lose sight of what is truly important. The first and most obvious thing is that it took place in a church. Not in the Houses of Parliament, the Palace of Westminster or any other civic building. Many years ago, I think it was 1998, I attended the inauguration of the Irish President in Dublin Castle. It was a civic and a secular affair and to be honest, it left me completely underwhelmed. Growing up in a country where a head of state was elected, it always seemed a little bit like a cross between the X factor and blind date. A person was chosen based on their popularity, and the audience that were choosing them didn't really know who they were voting for. And of course, with every election, there is always a winner. But for every winner, there is a loser. People who feel disenfranchised. The only small mercy was that it was much more civilized than the polemics of the American presidential election. There is a huge difference between electing a head of state and inaugurating them to serve for four years or seven years or whatever period of time and crowning a monarch who is pledging himself to a life of devoted service with no hope of retirement. For over 1,000 years, the British monarch has been crowned in a religious ceremony, fusing together temporal power and spiritual humility. The first words spoken in the service were to welcome Charles in the name of the King of Kings. And he responded, in his name, and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. And it's in those opening words that we see the heart of the coronation service laid bare to us all. When all the pageantry is stripped away, it is a commissioning to a lifetime of service. And service is the heart of all Christian life and ministry. Always following the example of our Lord. In the Anglican tradition, we have three services of ordination. We ordain bishops and priests and deacons. But it doesn't matter where you end up. Every single person who is ever ordained begins as a deacon. After a year or two, 
most will become priests. And after many years, a few are chosen to be bishops to lead the church. But all start and end their ministry as deacons. When you become a priest, you don't lay aside your role as a deacon. Being a priest is an additional ministry, not a change of ministry. And a deacon's job is to serve. A deacon is to visit and care for the poor and the needy, to visit the sick, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked. It all comes from the words and the actions of Jesus Christ, who in the upper room laid aside his outer room, wrapped a towel around him and washed his disciples' feet, teaching them that true greatness is found not in being served, but in being a servant of all. To mark out the ministry of a deacon, they wear distinctive robes, a plain white bow with a stole and a dalmatic. When a monarch is crowned, they're vested in a series of beautiful golden vestments, stunning in their beauty and design and their value. But contained within it all are the robes of a deacon. A constant reminder that that is where their kingship or their queenship begins. That real power is found not in command and decree, but in giving and in service. During the rite of coronation, many things are presented to the king, but the first and foremost happens at the beginning of the service, when he was presented with a Bible, a reminder that his first duty as king is to immerse himself in the word of God, and for that word to be his constant guide and rule throughout his reign. Having taken his oaths, the king prayed publicly and openly for the grace of God to be a leader for all people. A theme which returns powerfully again and again throughout the service, but especially when he is presented with the orb, a golden globe representing the world. But not just a single sphere, a globe surmounted by a cross, a reminder that all of the world stands under the cross of Calvary, and a reminder that all that we have and all that we are is temporal, but that the cross is eternal. One day, King Charles will go the way of all flesh, and so too will we. Our earthly lives will come to an end, our mortal remains will be returned to the dust of the earth. All our achievements, all our ambitions, all we have created and accumulated will turn to dust. But the cross will continue to stand, offering the world hope, offering the world salvation, and offering the world eternal life in Jesus Christ. As well as the orb, the king was presented with swords, not, as you might expect, the weapons of war, but the swords of spiritual justice and mercy, symbolizing the defense and protection of the good and advocacy for the defenseless. A pair of scepters were presented to the king, one surmounted by a cross and an orb into a gloved hand, the other surmounted by a dove. The first, again the world surmounted by the cross, symbolizing his temporal power always under the cross and held in a gloved hand, a reminder to always hold power gently. The second, a scepter with a dove, known as the rod of equity and mercy, a representation of the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, and a reminder that the monarch's rule and reign is not just of temporal power, but a pastoral role, caring for his people as a shepherd for his flock, guided always by the power of the Holy Ghost. And even the very crown with which he was crowned sits beneath the cross, a constant reminder to him each time he wears it 
and to everyone who gazes upon it, that his authority is always subservient to that of Jesus Christ. And the act of coronation concluded where it began. As the choir sang, keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. The final words of King David spoken to his son, King Solomon, in the Old Testament, drawing us back again to the beginning of the ceremony, the presentation of the Bible and the importance of the words of God. Then, having been crowned, the first act of the new monarch is to kneel before the altar of God to receive the Holy Communion. Back again to the upper room. Back again to the commandment of Jesus to love as he has loved us. Back to the bowl and the towel of sacrifice and foot washing and service. And back again to the cross. When we step behind all of the pomp and all of the pageantry, we have witnessed what is the most profound and moving and spiritual event that any of us will ever see. Our King is undoubtedly the most powerful man in the world, not just as sovereign of the United Kingdom and Australia and Canada and all his other realms and dominions and territories, not just as head of all of the armed forces of those nations, not even as head of the Commonwealth, but also to one who is looked up to and respected by leaders and statesmen and rulers and governments the world over. And all his power stands beneath that old rugged cross of Christ. And his true vocation is not to reign, but to serve. And it is that truth which brings us to the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the king who reigned not from a throne of gold, but from a cross of wood, whose crown was not a crown of jewels, but one of thorns, whose purple robe was dangled for by soldiers, whose insignia of office were his nail-marked hands and feet and his spear-pierced side, who rode a donkey of peace rather than a great stallion of war, whose army were fishermen and peasants, whose weapons were love and forgiveness, and whose shield was the word of God. Today, as we celebrate and give thanks and rejoice with all of the United Kingdom, as we give thanks to King Charles for all that he has been and all that he will be, let it always be a reminder that we also belong to another king, the one from whom Charles looks for authority and example, that we belong to two kingdoms, a temporal kingdom which will one day pass away, and an eternal kingdom, the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, a kingdom which will endure when this old and weary earth is no more. A kingdom in which we shall live forever and ever, when our earthly days have come to an end. For all who believe and trust in Christ, there will be a day when we cast all our crowns before him, when we too are lost in wonder, love and praise. God save the king. And now to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be ascribed as his most justly due all might, majesty, dominion, power, and glory, henceforth and forevermore.
families, neighbours and friends yes. who are coming together across the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth to mark our coronation. We greatly appreciate everyone's efforts to organise such celebrations like this and very much hope that they will be enjoyable and happy occasions. As we look towards the future, we feel deeply touched and sustained by the heartfelt, heartfelt good wishes and support of so many kind people around the country. Thank you. For all the safety. Jesus said to his disciples, You know that in the world rulers lord it over their subjects and make them feel the weight of their authority. It shall not be so with you. Among you, whoever will be great must be your servant, and whoever will be first must be the willing minister of all. In thanksgiving for the coronation of Charles Arkin, I invite you to join with me in dedication to the service of this nation and commonwealth. Will you pledge yourselves to promote the unity of this realm in the fellowship of the commonwealth? Will you uphold the ministers of the crown in the cause of justice and peace? Will you defend our heritage of freedom and seek the common good? Eternal God, your Son Jesus Christ came among us as a servant and revealed the majesty of your kingdom. By the power of your Holy Spirit, lead us in truth, guide us in peace, enrich us with your grace and keep us faithful in your service, now and forever. Amen. And so in celebration, thanksgiving and renewal, we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the king, the commonwealth, and all mankind, peace and comfort, and to us and all his servants, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.